Interview Radia Student Jutri se v kino Šiška po dobrih šestih letih vrača cenjeni britanski elektronski dvojec Otakr, ki je skupaj z Apex Twinom in Square Pusherjem, ki ga bomo v Šiški videli decembra, sredi 90-ih na noge postavil glasbene smernice za ložbe Warp. V intervju, ki smo ga z njima opravili pred dobro uro, sta spregovorila tudi o tem, kje se vidita znotraj sodobne elektronske glasbe, pa o povsem novem setu, kje boj, da nastajajo tudi s kinom Šiška v mislih in še čem. Ja, yeah, so, you're currently on a tour. Um, how is the tour going? It's going really well. Um, we've had some great reactions. It's interesting because we're playing slightly different kind of music to the last few tours that we've done. Mm-hmm. But um, it seems to, people seem to really like it. It's been, we've been getting great reactions. Mm-hmm. How is it different to previous times? It's a little bit slower um, and a little bit more focused on sound than the beat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's nothing like, you know, those those live sets you released last year. That's right. I think we we basically come to the end of the line with that particular set when we came to make a new one. We wanted mm-hmm. it to be a, quite different to that, you know. Mm-hmm. Was it uh, somehow inspired with the last album? The I don't know how is it pronounced. Is it Elsek? Yeah, a little maybe. I mean, El- LC was was kind of made around the same time as the last live set. So those tracks were tracks that we didn't use in the live set that we just recorded in the studio. So, um, but they were made using the same setup as the that the AE live set stuff. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of related to that more than it is to the new stuff. The new stuff's kind of its own thing, really. Mm-hmm. Um, what kind of gear are you using to, for a live setup at the moment? Is it digital or uh, analog? Well, well, both, but it's, it's computers. It's just all done with computers now. But mm-hmm. um, we use Max MSP and um, a digital analog converter and a couple of controllers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you played here, well, over six years ago now. Uh, right. And and it was the first time then, you know, and after the concert, uh, well, quite a few people thought that uh, you, you your first show came too late, you know, well, many years too late. And I was wondering, um, since you've been making music for over 25 years, well, close to 30, is there a period perhaps that stands out, stands out for you? Or maybe what were the most exciting years to be part of Otakar? I don't really think of it in those terms. I think even on a tour like this, we have some days that are quite boring and some days that are really exciting and interesting. So I'm not sure that I can think of a period of time. If it was like that, I think I would have probably given up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, you don't really know when the surprising things are going to be and when it's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. And what does the effect, um, you know, you say that even now some some unings are not that good, you know, what what does the effect the particular show? Sorry, I, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, what do you, when you know the show wasn't as good as you wanted it to be, what usually affects that? Oh, uh, technical problems usually. Something that we did wrong mm-hmm. or something that the software did that we didn't predict. Um, mm-hmm. Or sometimes not being able to hear the results of your work on stage. Like sometimes if the sound system's so big in the venue, but mm-hmm. there's no sort of feedback from yeah, the room, you can't hear what you're doing on stage as well. So if there are technical problems, you can't get over them as quickly. But my f- most fun times are when the set's going well and we can hear what we're doing. And we're able to sort of react immediately to what's going on and 
change it, improve it, or repair things, or or just be creative. So mm-hmm. yeah, they're usually the ones that work well, and anything else that doesn't let us hear what we're doing or the sound system's no good. Um, it's usually not our fault, you know what I mean? I mean, we we work pretty hard to cover all bases and make sure it's not going to fuck up. But just sometimes there's something that you've overlooked, especially with Max. There are so many combinations and possibilities and things that mm-hmm. it might do. It's quite difficult to debug, so, you know, it can catch you off guard when you're on stage, but it might not feel like it's your fault, you know? So, mm. but yeah, that, that stuff, it can be really annoying, but it can also make it really exciting and interesting, if, yeah, yeah. if you overcome it on stage, you know? Yeah, this similar experience we had with um, Betters, they're also from Warp. Um, you right. know, on their previous tour, when they had those big video screens and things weren't working, but they, they solved the problem really well, and it kind of added something to the whole experience. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. It's part of what we do. I mean, I don't think we'd be happy just using something that never broke. You know? Or never changed. <laughs> or never changed. I, I think yeah. sometimes, I think what I was saying before about being able to hear the, the, the sound system well, Mm-hmm. It allows a bit of chance to have an influence in what's happening on the night, mm-hmm. as opposed to uh, perhaps being um, detrimental. It, it usually becomes an enhancement or a, a con- you know contribution mm-hmm. of a good kind. Um, you know, this not being able to hear good enough uh, the music that you are playing, that you were just explaining, is this something connected to this uh, new live approach, or did this sort of thing happen before? Oh, no, it's not that. It's, um, sometimes it's poor monitoring, but not on this talk because we actually take our own monitors with us. Mm-hmm. But occasionally it's just difficult because a lot of clubs nowadays use line array and all the sound goes away from the stage. So it's, it's difficult from the stage sometimes with some of the newer venues mm-hmm. to actually hear what you're putting out. Paradoxically, they tend to be the venues with the best sound. Um, it's just, the, you know, and what you want in a venue, you don't want all the sound to go back towards the stage, really. Mm. That's not good sound, but there are issues with it in that you can't really get a sense of how loud it is from the stage. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I don't, personally, I don't really have much of a problem with that. I just play and get on with it, but it is a little bit weird when you can't hear it and they all can hear it, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, going back to you producing music for a long time as I said earlier for over 25 years um, you know I was wondering what motivates you nowadays after all these years uh, just the, uh, just the sheer amount of bad music that's out there really um, <laughs> you know I think you, you have to kind of put in lots of good music to try and reset the balance you know mm. no, I mean I, I kind of I'm joking you know that but I don't really know I mean me personally I just make stuff because I want to hear it um, and there's I think even though there is a lot of music around nowadays there isn't as much variety or at least it doesn't feel like that and I think yeah. that's perhaps one of the things for us is that I'll feel that there's a gap or there's something I'm not hearing mm. and I'll try and make that so I guess as long as I feel like that, that there's something that I want to make that I don't already own or that I can't buy then mm. that's enough motivation really you know, right. just, that's kind of why we did it in the first place. Right. So, and th- that reason hasn't really changed. The world's still giving me that same mm-hmm. um, need for music. You know. Right. Uh, yeah, it's definitely become became much tougher. You know, to to find the really interesting stuff. But there is. Yeah. You know, quite, quite there, there is so many things. I mean, it's not even. I'm not saying that there's a lot of bad music. I mean, there is, but. Mm-hmm. But I guess there's also a lot more good music now. But it's, yeah, quite, yeah. it's quite difficult to find because there's just fucking million things out there. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a bit like when I was really young and I'd go to a jazz shop and I'd look at all the records and just feel like I wouldn't even know where to start. And I think people must feel like that a lot with music now. They want someone else to curate it for them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why playlists are so popular. Mm-hmm. You know, even on streaming services, people are quite happy to listen to an artist playlist by some other public person. Yeah, that every, I think people just want things to be curated. It's the same with live events. You know, you go to a live event now, there'll be 5,000 acts on, and, you know, and it's all been curated by a tastemaker. And that's not something you used to see so much. I mean, it mm-hmm. used to just be that people went to events to see 
bands that they already knew about. But nowadays, you'll get kids going to events and they won't know half the bands who play it. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're relying so much on a third party choosing it all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe this is now, well, particularly uh, visible in the United States when when one sound become popular suddenly there's lots of people copying it um, you right. know. yeah I mean it is true it happens a lot there it's mm-hmm. also in the UK as well I mean I, I'm not complaining about this I think it's good that we have scenes still to help it mm-hmm. but you know there will be thousands of records that sound really similar to each other mm-hmm. but yeah. lots, lots of festivals that actually have the same lineup in one summer Yeah, that's right. going on the whole world, and there'll be a curatorial <laughs> thread amongst different mm-hmm. festivals. Or almost like the festivals are influencing influencing one another. Mm-hmm. They yeah, also have the same kind of current lineup. You do see a lot of the same acts in different countries now. That's not something we used to see as much. Yeah. And even somewhere like Slovenia, I imagine that there are festivals. There certainly are in Croatia and some of the other parts of the far more eastern bloc countries, mm-hmm. where you'll see the same list of acts that you'd see at a London festival. Yeah, I think this is because, you know, the promoters or the people that are putting together these festivals are, are actually British or, you know, oh, I don't know, okay. Scandinavian. That makes, that makes a lot, really, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it kind of it's makes not, sense. It's not necessarily that bad a thing, it's just that, I'd say 20 years ago, when if we'd have gone to a festival in Croatia, say, we would have been playing alongside whatever music they like, mm-hmm. and it would have been a lot more varied and perhaps strange to us, no? Um, not mm-hmm. necessarily to our taste, but it would be the sound of what people like there. And yeah, you don't really get that as much now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fashion is, is the same thing. You know, people tend to wear the same clothes as well throughout <laughs> the Western developed world. Right. Their dress code. This is new, really. Not mm-hmm. seeing this. Um, you know, you were explaining there is lots of music nowadays. And what, what, what type of music do you listen to nowadays or maybe uh, since you're saying that the lineups are very much alike uh, throughout the festivals really um, did you maybe see some cool live acts recently no i haven't seen any that i thought so when when was the last time you played in the uh, united states uh, last year um Yeah. You did you did the whole tour? Yeah, it's about 12 months ago. We did we did 21 days, I think. Mhm. Um, you know, I actually did an interview like 10 years ago with Sean. It was also over the phone uh, and at, at that time I think Sean kind of said that he has this feeling that maybe American audience wasn't as knowledgeable as British or European audience That's and I was wondering Yeah, so it's still the same. It's still I the same. I think the thing is now, though, right, they've all done a crash course in the history of techno, you know? Um, mm. So I think they know a little bit more. They've got kind of Wikipedia-level knowledge of dance music. <laughs> yeah, you know? b- but, you know, now that the this electronic dance music is becoming really popular, I think, well, there are people that are kind of digging in deeper, you know, looking for interesting stuff that happened yeah. maybe before they even know what electronic dance music is. Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm, I think what? in America there's a there's a tendency for people to listen to quite urban music in a domestic setting. Um you know, they'll be sat at home listening to dance track. Mm. And uh that that really is unsustainable. That that what you normally get happening after that is a period of people who don't go to clubs making club music mm-hmm. and, and that's basically what you'll see over the next few years you know and what you, we've seen it even in the last few years really mm-hmm. um, you know the, I don't know if you noticed this or not um, when, when you played this last tour in United States uh, was there maybe a difference you know in attendance or something because the EDM got so popular Yeah, that is weird, because, I mean, obviously the kids going to the gigs, they're not EDM kids. But, um, but yeah, we've seen this upsurge in interest. It was mainly, main, I think it was mainly sold out. The tour, yeah, we did really well. I mean, it, it was a little bit surprising to us, 
because you know 2005 and 2008 in America they were the last tours we did mm -hmm. it was at a real low and there were not really too many clubs even in America at that point mm -hmm. and it just exploded after 2008-9 the dubstep thing it just kind of exploded everywhere um, mm. and now it's it's a really different environment where we are considered part of kind of techno history and everyone's mm. learned in America now everyone's aware of techno history and so we attract a kind of mixed crowd of some older people who have, who've grown up with it and younger people who don't seem to really understand much about dance music at all um, but they think that we're part of that history and so they come and see us. I okay. probably find that quite confusing. Mm -hmm. I think there's that upsurge as well, and the reality was that we hadn't been there for six or seven years already. Mm -hmm. So there was already kind of a... seemed to be like a, a, a more eager sort of turnout. It's good that we waited out the screw next year. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, there were a few years where it would have been still difficult for us, even though there was a lot of interest in EDM or whatever. But mm. in, a, in a way, it's funny, because in America, really, everything now is split into either EDM or IDM. <laughs> and that seems really absurd to me, but it, it's kind of happened that way. So mm. now you've got this thing where IDM is now seen as having much more weight and, and kind of presence than it used to have. It used to just be this stupid little thing mm. up, unseen that no one cared about. Yeah, now yeah. it's actually something kids will describe their own music as, and that's... There's an antithesis to EDM, perhaps, or something. Yeah, exactly. It's like a way of saying, I make electronic dance music, but it isn't EDM. And now, so all those people are now calling their work idea. Like, people like Arca are self-claiming it, you know. <laughs> and this is, yeah, that's quite unusual to see people actually proudly describing their work that way. Um, mm. do, do you follow or do you listen to any of that kind of music? You know, because when, well, EDM, EDM first started to become popular, I don't know, about 10 years ago, maybe, when Skrillex uh, got popular, and he would mention war artists, you know, often as, as his influences. And there were people who didn't know about electronic music beforehand. And after hearing Skrillex or becoming his fans, they started looking back, you know, to to find the interesting stuff. And in the, for example, in the IDM community, the EDM sound or that dubstep, dubstep uh, derivate from the United States, um, was kind of almost a taboo, you know, but nowadays I, I think it's becoming a bit less so because people are getting, even, I mean, IDM people are getting interested in what the EDM guys are doing. And I was wondering, do you listen to I any of them? I mean, I, I never had a problem with Skrillex, you know. Um, we used to get asked what we thought of Skrillex in about 08, 09, when he was first popping up, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd get asked for my opinion on him and I'd say the same then. She's like, you know, I understand it completely. I see why kids are into that. It makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's just not really what I've grown up with, so maybe I'm just not used to that kind of raving. But yeah. I get it. I absolutely get it. It's, it's obviously American. Americans would do that. You know, they'd emphasise the mid-range, make it sound nasty and <laughs> kind of aggressive, like a teenager. Let's not go. Yeah, and that, that's what America have done with all their fucking music genres. Rock and roll is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm happy for him to do that, to dance music. I don't have any problem with it at all. I understand that it. it's American, it's got a real rock and roll feel. I mean, it's a bit nasty to me. I'd never fucking buy a Skrillex record, do you know what I mean? But at the same time, I'm not going to condemn it, because I, I, I see a lot of value in it. Also, see, some of his sound design is actually pretty fucking good. Yeah, it's a yeah. lot better than a lot of techno producers. Mm -hmm. but the creative dynamic. Yeah. They just never admit it. It's just he's technically a little bit better than most techno producers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of hard thing for a lot of people to to accept. You know, because yeah, he just yeah. doesn't come with all that cool cachet that a lot of techno producers do. He's, he's mm -hmm. a stupid little kid jumping up and down, just full of energy. Actually, with long <laughs> hair, yeah. looks like a rock and roll. He didn't even look like a techno. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, in the same way, I think that Kanye probably annoyed a lot of hip-hop people in the mid-2000s by wearing skinny jeans, you know? Mm. It's, sometimes it's good to just throw a curveball in there and see what happens, even if it's something so nasty that everyone's really familiar with it already from another era. I don't really care, you know? 
I mean, it's like I say, Americans have been doing that shit for years. I mean, even fucking Richie Orton and Plus Eight originally were doing that to an extent. You know, they were slightly kind of whitey playing dance music, mm-hmm. making it a little bit more nasty sounding. You know? Yeah. yeah. I think it's unfair to be snobby to Skrillex and people like Dead Mouse. You know, I, I understand what they're going for, but and they are actually achieving what they set out to do. So yeah, yeah. at least deserve respect. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we came to an end of this interview, so maybe just this, this last question. Um, you know, in previous interview, that one we did 10 years ago, um, you said that you were basically making 4-4 for, for, for the floor music. So this new set that you're going to play tomorrow is, as you mentioned, probably going to be a bit different. Yeah, it's, it's quite, I mean, I wouldn't describe it as um, ambient, but I've read the word ambient in a couple of reviews. I don't, because it isn't ambient, I really, I wouldn't call it ambient, I don't mind if other people do. Mm-hmm. It's slower and it's more, it's kind of intense and there's a lot of, um, a lot of the sequencing is still very complex but it's a lot of curves rather than a discrete event, so it sort of sounds smooth and kind of sophisticated, if that's mm-hmm. the right word, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really is quite different to the last live set and I think people are, Some people are adjusting to it quite well and other people are a little bit resistant because they don't know what the fuck it is. It's quite mm. difficult to categorize it. Yeah. I think in a similar way, actually, like Oversteps is a little bit difficult to categorize. Mm. It's not really an ambient album, but it's also not anything else. So yeah, people yeah. tend to use the word ambient when they talk about it, but it doesn't resemble any other ambient. I think it's a similar thing with this set. It's just its own thing, really. I suppose we just think of it as our techno. We don't really have another word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, are there any plans that you might release this material that you're playing live as an album in the future? We want to. We're trying to record it every night, but um, we've had a couple of technical hiccups, so we haven't managed to record everything, but the mm-hmm. majority of it we have recorded. And if we end up coming home with enough good sets, then we'll release a chunk. Like quite a few of them. Mm-hmm, but if mm-hmm. there are not enough good ones, then we wouldn't release any. So mm-hmm. we need a body of it, don't we? We're only like we've only done five dates. We've got another how many we've got left? Something like twenty three. We've got another twenty three. So mm-hmm. hopefully among them there'll be at least maybe five good ones. If there are then we'll release them. Yeah. Maybe some more. Yeah, if they go well for us on stage in a creative way, mm-hmm. that, that's good. There's another it's another question to ask have they been recorded successfully you know, mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. quite difficult depending on the stage or the setup yeah we could production. just have something for cock on because we do the recording as well on stage so mm-hmm. it only takes one thing to go wrong and then yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> it's not recorded so right yeah it just depends if we wanted to get enough recorded we'll, we'll, we aim to plan to release but mm. we we don't really want to say yeah whether or not that'll definitely happen mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, decided. Yeah, we did to get the sets home and listen to them a few times before we'll know whether it's actually worth doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So, great news for the end. Uh, and, well, we will see you tomorrow in Kino Shishka. Excellent. Well, we look forward to it. Slovenia is definitely an interesting place. Nice venue, Cisco, as well. It was. I, I remember feeling very good about the sound in there. Yeah, the sound in there is fucking great. So. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the, it'll, be, it'll be good for this set, I think. I think it'll work in there really well. Nice, nice. I Thank think you. in a way we've found ourselves in venues like Cisco that is perhaps um, and like give us an, an insight in in what what a different approach to a live set can, can it was you can do. It was actually one of the venues that we referenced when we came back and made this set to model this tour. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we thought that this set would work well in these kind of venues because it's. <laughs> So well kitted out in there. Yeah. Yeah, I think the... I think it's kind of a surround system or something like yeah. that. It's just the acoustics are really good. Yeah, it was uh-huh. good, and I think because when we came back, we said, "Well, what 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 kind of music would be good in a venue like that that isn't what we do?" You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it should be good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Excellent news once oh, again. Cool. So thank you. All right. Cheers. Take care. See, yeah, no see you tomorrow. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye.
Tako se je v svojem novem setu, ki naj bi bolj slonil na oblikovanju zvoka, razgovoril kultni britanski elektronski dvojec Otakr. Kako bo set slišati v živo, pa torej lahko preverite jutri zvečer v Kino Šiška, kjer bo sta dvojcu družbo delala še zvočni ekstremist Russell Haswell in Andy Maddox. Intervju je pripravil Goran Kompoš. Intervju Radija Študent.